can see what he can do in the midst of unbelievers on the leading edge with his word, his power, his grace, and his mercy. For God's sakes, we're Lutheran. This is what we know. Sounds good. Well, uh, Whitmer Project, thank you so much, guys, for joining us again. This is your host, Dr. Athanasius. Today, I have a very special host, a uh, very special guest. Uh, his name is Dr. or Pastor Paul Riedeke. Riedeke or Riedeke. How, how do you pronounce it, Pastor? Riedeke? Riedeke. Riedeke. Oh, Riedeke. What, what, is the, what is the origin of that last name, by the way? I'm, I'm curious. Is that Polish? 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 There you go. I guessed it. So, yes. Uh, again, thank you so much for joining us, family. And uh, Paul Riedeke is with us. Um, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe. It really helps the channel help us to get the uh, message of the gospel from the Lutheran perspective out there. And um, as we always say, the Patreon, everything that's donated to the Patreon uh, account will be used to serve the community, uh, to help churches out and people that are in need, especially in our moment, uh, in the moment that we're going through right now with so much economic turmoil, uh, families that are suffering and so and whatnot. So all of that is, is secured for that. Um, so, yeah, Pastor, again, thank you so much for joining me. Um, we have a series, my my, my, uh, my friend and co-host, uh, we've, we've had a series talking about this uh, issue. We think it's uh, very important. I think uh, that as Lutherans, uh, you know, we have this uh, long tradition of, you know, you know, one of the sayings that we have in our tradition is that justification is the uh, pillar where the church either stands or falls. And so I feel that... Uh, it, it is something that we just have to get straight, that we have to have to get right. And uh, also, I wanted to um, thank you um, personally for the series that uh, that you put out, the video series where you and some other men pastors also participated. I thought it was great. I, it was very instructive, very um, enlightening as far as the um, the issue, the importance of justification. And also, as I told you in, in private. I also uh, thank God for providing for your family. I know that you went through a very uh, tough times. Um, you know when you, you know where you, you you'll explain more later. I suppose uh, you know sure. the whole experience that you had. So um, yeah, just why uh, don't we just get it started like this? Um, I I always try to do a little bit of journalistic work, if you will, and try to figure out where things come out. I don't believe that things just start or come out of no nothing. So in this specific uh, uh, topic that we're talking, I think it would be appropriate for us to ask the, co the question, where this, the objective justification came from? Uh, what was the need to bring it forth? Or even uh, going back a little, um, is it, was it a new doctrine? Uh, you know, how, how old it is? So if, if you can give us that, you know, that kind of background setup, you know, it's for us to have an understanding of where in history we are, why it came around, what uh, the people that came out with this, uh, let's say, teaching or doctrine or thesis, what were they aiming at? And so if you, if you can go there, I would appreciate it. I think it would be helpful. Okay, sure. It's, it's a big question and it's really a, a long answer. I'll try to boil it down as much as I can. Um, the, the microphone is your pastor. You take your time. Awesome. <laughs> uh, already back in the 1590s, um, after the Book of Concord was was uh, written and subscribed in 1580, um, already in the 1590s, uh, a man named Samuel Huber was invited to be a teacher at the university in Wittenberg, together with um, Egidius Hunius and Polycarp Leiser, Leisner and uh, Samuel Gessner, okay. Solomon Gessner, sorry. Um, they, they had invited him to Wittenberg thinking he would be a great help against the Calvinists or the crypto Calvinists that had been invading Saxony kind of secretly uh, teaching Calvinistic doctrines. Mm -hmm. And one of the worst of those, of course, is the doctrine of limited atonement, that Christ didn't die for for all people. Actually, he only died for uh, the elect, that small group who will end up in heaven one day. Mm -hmm. And uh, Huber had been a Calvinist in, Swi in Switzerland prior to coming to Wittenberg, but he had always apparently disagreed with limited atonement and had preached against it uh, pretty, uh, pretty strongly in Switzerland. So then uh, he became 
a Lutheran, came to Wittenberg and started to teach at Wittenberg. But it was within three years that, um, the, that the Lutherans in Wittenberg realized that not only was Samuel Huber teaching uh, an unlimited atonement, which was good, but he was conflating atonement with things like election and justification. So, so he would teach um, unlimited atonement, but in his thinking that that meant that the election itself had to also be unlimited and apply to all men hmm. and justification had to be unlimited and already extend over all men. Hmm. Um, if, if, if atonement is unlimited, he reasoned, then justification also has to be unlimited. Hmm. And the, the uh, professors in Wittenberg immediately recognized this is not what Lutherans teach. This is not what the Bible teaches. Election is particular by definition, and justification is particular by definition because while atonement is unlimited, if, mm -hmm. if the atonement is not applied to a person, then God has no basis for justifying that person. Correct. Um, our justification is based on the atonement made by Christ and then applied to the believer by the Holy Spirit when he brings us to faith. So it's the doctrine of objective subjective justification wasn't called that by Huber, mm -hmm. although he did refer to it as general justification versus particular justification, mm -hmm. which are terms that did come up later in the church and were used in a similar way. Okay. Okay, very that, good. It, go, it, go ahead, if, go ahead. If you, want, if you want, we can fast forward from there. How, however much Huber influenced people in Germany um, after that time, after he was kicked out of Wittenberg and, and banned from that territory. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know uh, okay. who kept following him or who didn't follow him. Um, the, the teaching, uh, whether based, whether coming from Huber or, or coming from another place, showed up in America in the mid to late 1800s. Okay. Um, and so it has it has been around with people um, assuming that unlimited atonement, which is Lutheran, mm -hmm. must also imply unlimited or universal justification, which really isn't Lutheran, but it it got lumped in with Lutheran teaching in the uh, late 1800s. Okay. So Dr. Huber, what he did, just to make sure uh, and, and kind of pin it down, uh, he had the correct view of atonement, which is that it is unlimited. Christ did die for everybody, but he also said that everybody was also elect. How does that, that seems to not work like just on its face. And then also that Christ, obviously, well, Christ justified everybody because that's the error that we're trying to explain today. And, you know, that we are zeroing in on today. But the, I would have never uh, imagined or guessed that uh, he would have conflated election and say that, how, how, how do you explain that biblically? That, that will be an interesting uh, exercise to get into later. And, you know, just for, um, I'm kind of, a, I love history. I like to uh, delve into history uh, and, and figure out uh, where we came from and things like this. And you, when you said crypto Calvinist, immediately I thought about, uh, there was a story of this, um, this this king or prince that was trying to be, that, the, that Calvinists were trying to influence through his wife, have you heard of this uh, story? That yeah. they were that that the king intercepted a letter that his wife was having with some Calvinist professor that was teaching in Wittenberg. I always forget the name of this king, but I, I always uh, I think it's fascinating. Either, but I, the story <laughs> sounds familiar. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, anyway, so that is how that is how uh, Huber is. Huber would be uh, the sort of the first person that started teaching. Um, you know, uh, you know uh, that Christ justified everybody with his death and also teaching it that election was also for everybody, however irrational that sounds. So anyways, what, the, what did the uh, old, as they, they're called, the old dogmaticians, what is a proper, so when we, when we go through the book of Concord, or the, more specifically, I would guess the formula of Concord, what does it teach? What is a proper... Um, you know, Lutheran teaching in that way. Sure. 
every time that the Book of Concord goes to define the word to justify or justification, mm -hmm. um, they equate it with it's a courtroom or forensic declaration mm -hmm. um, that that someone who was guilty is not guilty, is is righteous, mm -hmm. always on the basis of Christ's atoning work applied to that person through faith, mm -hmm. worked by the Holy Spirit. Okay. So it always includes God's grace as the only motivation for our justification, not anything we've done or, or could do. Always uh, Christ's merit, Christ's active and passive obedience as the, the reason for our justification or the, the basis for God to be able to declare a guilty person righteous. Mm -hmm. Um, always the the word of God or the means of grace by which the spirit works the fourth thing, which is faith in the individual. Mm -hmm. Those four things combined um, result in a person's justification. Good. Is there any specific place in the book of Concord where you would that you would point to that speaks specifically to this? Because, uh, you know, I've also I've also heard uh, pastor discussions in which uh, you know, and I try not to get too deep into the weeds, uh, especially online on, on online discussions. Mm -hmm. uh, and they start going to the book of Concord and 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 quoting this guy over here, this guy, and kind of uh, interpreting it. Is is there any confusion as to what <laughs> the book of Concord or the or the formula of Concord teaches in regards to this? Like, is there any space, uh, anything that could be interpreted? differently or you, you understand what I'm saying? There are things that people uh, that work really hard to interpret differently. Okay. But really, it's it's very simple throughout the Book of Concord. Um, I'll, obviously, um, the Augsburg Confession Article 4 is, is okay. the short and succinct article on justification. Okay. Um, but, but let me actually read a, a part from the apology from article okay. five where, article Mo five where Melanchthon writes this he says furthermore in this passage to justify means according to court language to acquit a guilty person and declare him righteous but this happens because of the righteousness of another namely of christ this righteousness is communicated to us through faith yes therefore since our righteousness in this passage is the credit of the righteousness of another, we mm -hmm. must here speak about righteousness in a way different than in philosophy or in a civil court. Mm -hmm. So Paul says in 1 Corinthians 1, Christ is the source of your life in Christ Jesus, whom God made our wisdom and our righteousness and sanctification and redemption, um, etc. And then he, he closes that part. But because Christ's righteousness is given to us through faith, faith is righteousness credited to us. In other mm. words, it is that by which we are made acceptable to God on account of the credit and ordinance of God. As Paul says, faith is counted as righteousness. Yes. Um, yes. That's not one that's uh, always read in this connection, but obviously mm -hmm. uh, Melanchthon is, is very explicitly defining justification and the whole process for us right there. Yes. Um, do we acknowledge that um, Christ is righteous, whether we have faith or not? Of course. <laughs> yes. Do we acknowledge that Christ earned God's earned a righteous verdict for everyone, that he merited that, that uh, he earned forgiveness for all people? Of course, mm -hmm. whether we believe that he earned it or not. But mm -hmm. we aren't actually justified in any in any sense apart from faith in Christ whose mm -hmm. righteousness is credited to our account by faith. Seems to be like a very biblical thing. It's, uh, you know, with, with the example of Abraham, he believed God and, you know, he was seen righteous in the eyes of God. I mean, it was counted to him as righteousness when he believed the promises of God. And then yeah. Jesus later in the gospel says, you know, Abraham was looking towards my day, you know, which is kind of connected in faith and the promise. It seems to be... Uh, very obvious, but you know, Pastor. Now that I have you here with me, uh, you know, we don't want to um, uh, represent, uh, you know, say, let's call it the other side of the of the debate. We don't want to put them as, you know, you know, crazies or people that don't know what they're talking about. We do understand, and we do, we, we would agree that we think that they are in error. But, but 
coming from their perspective, what are what are they afraid of? I, I don't think that people hold to beliefs just because they want to be contrarian. I, I think that they what what is what is their concern? What is you know what what are they seeing in us that that they would think these people are just crazies or I've heard uh, I've been called a heretic and things like this. What are they what are they seeing that alarms them so much? Um, there's a few things, but um, maybe it all boils down to um, the certainty of the gospel, first of mm -hmm. all, and what the gospel even is. Mm -hmm. The gospel, uh, according to scripture, the gospel, according to Luther, the gospel, according to the book of Concord, is God's promise. And Luther summarizes it beautifully. His promise in Mark 16, 16, he who believes and is baptized will be saved. Luther mm -hmm. says that's the gospel. But that's a promise. Hmm. The gospel is a promise. And throughout the book of Concord, it's treated as a promise. And justification happens as the result of faith in a promise. Mm -hmm. um, those who believe in objective justification uh, ridicule the notion that you can have faith in something that hasn't already happened. And, and I don't understand why they have redefined faith that way. Mm. Um, yes, Christ died. It's not faith to say Christ died. It's not faith to say Christ rose again. That simple fact, you're recounting facts of history. I guess you can say I believe those facts because uh, of scripture and, and the Holy Spirit, but that's not justification, believing that Christ died or rose again. Mm. Justification is faith in the promise that whoever believes in this Christ who died for all, who rose again for our justification, mm -hmm. um, faith, whoever believes in him receives God's forgiveness, is accepted as a child of God through, through mm -hmm. adoption and is made mm -hmm. an heir of eternal life. That's a promise. And, and there seems to be some uncertainty about a, a promise as if a promise wasn't really all that uh, sturdy, as if uh, the, the promise, but, but, but that means that requires you to believe it, mm -hmm. to believe the promise of what God will do, or is now doing uh, for the sake of Christ. And so they say, no, you have to, in order to, to believe that you're justified, mm -hmm. you must have already been justified. Mm. I can't tell you you're absolved or I forgive you mm -hmm. unless you were already forgiven unless it's already a fact. And now you just have to accept that which is already a fact. Mm. That's not a promise anymore. That's simply accepting uh, something, accepting what already happened. Uh, uh, like, a, like believing a fact that is already a fact. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a textbook like, thing. Exactly. exactly. Which, uh, which is not really so, okay, I see what you're saying. It, it, so what we're saying is it is be it becomes a reality once you by faith appropriate what Christ did but they're saying no it is a reality already you just have to believe it it's it's kind of a game of yeah. <laughs> semantics <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah when does god justify us and that's that's what it comes down to did he justify us 2000 years ago and now we have to um, acknowledge that yeah. And, and when we acknowledge it, we can receive the benefit of it. Okay. Or uh, did Christ die for us 2,000 years ago, pay for our sins, um, make satisfaction for our sins, mm. and, and now uh, offer us justification as a gift to be received through faith? Mm. But, mm. but when does this justifying happen? It happens when we believe. That's what Article 4 exactly. of the Oxford Confession says. Abraham was justified the minute that he believed the promise that God made to him. Yeah. Faith, is that... was, faith was counted to him for righteousness. Yes. Exactly. And I know that because I've heard, you know, the, well, I, I don't want to, <laughs> the, 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 the um, you know, in the book, the, the Law and Gospel, uh, Article 14, they would say, you know, that like we are making faith a work. That's, um, I don't, I don't understand. I don't understand that. Uh, it, and, and not only I've heard it also from other uh, traditions where it's like, well, you're making faith 
a work by which like like God is impotent if you don't have this work of faith. So they word it in very, you know, it can be frustrating if, if yeah. But. It, it's frustrating because have there been people in history who have treated faith as a human work? Okay. Yes, there have been. Okay. Have there even been Lutherans who have misspoken or maybe misbelieved that, and, and taught faith as a human work as that one thing that the human being has to do oh, okay you, the one thing that you have to do is believe oh yes people have taught falsely about faith that way we can we're, we're, that but, pastor paul just interrupt you we're, so we're, mm -hmm. we're when we we're, we're talking about pelagians semi-pelagians semi that is that when you say make like you have to uh work up faith are, are you talking about or like um People that did this uh, revivals and they're acting as if you—is that what we're, what we're talking about here? So it, anywhere between anywhere from semi-Pelagians to Arians. Oh, and, there you go. It, Arianism, right? Um, those are, I'm sorry, Arianism, <laughs> Arminianism. Arminianism. Goodness, you, you, got, you caught me there because I go. I don't want to. Ar I don't want to contradict a much Different him. heresy. Sorry, <laughs> Arminianism, right? Joseph Arminianism. <laughs> okay. uh, yeah, Arminianism does treat faith as as man's the one work that man has to do god did everything else you have to do this that's not what we're saying that's not what scripture teaches or what lutheranism teaches about faith mm -hmm. it teaches that faith is a gift of god ephesians 2 but it, um th those who those who don't have any comfort in in that in justification by faith alone mm -hmm. um, seem to think that you can never actually be certain whether you're in the faith. Mm. And, and so again, they're looking for something that's so outside of us mm -hmm. that it actually has nothing to do with us, that we're all justified and you're not even in the picture. You're, mm -hmm. you're not, you're not, you don't have to be there. You don't, don't have to have been born. It already happened. Um, and so obviously faith is, is almost nothing now. It's just recognizing what already happened. Mm -hmm. um, scripture doesn't talk about faith in such a dubious way mm -hmm. where, well, yeah, I, I know you can't actually know if you believe in me, Jesus said. No, Jesus never said that. <laughs> um, Paul says in 2 Corinthians, um, examine yourselves to see if you are in the faith. Yes. Um, you, you can know that. Um, when Jesus says, whoever believes in me um, will never see death, mm -hmm. he doesn't make it a doubtful thing like, but you may never actually know if you believe that you believe in me. It gets very confusing. Um, faith is a much you're, more certain. You're, you're saved. Uh, your faith has saved you. He said to the woman. Yeah. So she, you know, it's a de facto thing. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You can be certain that you believe. Do you do you run to Christ for forgiveness, believing that He'll give it to you? Mm -hmm. You can yes or no. Um, yeah. You. Faith is a certain thing. It's not an uncertain thing. So what I see here, Dr. Uh, uh, Rydecki, is it, it, it all came out of a good intention. There was a good intention. I see you, individual X, uh, you are having problems as far as your faith. You are questioning, you're doubting. So to help you, I'm going to tell you, it is completely outside of you. You don't have to doubt it. In fact, it doesn't even matter because it was all done for you. You were justified before you were, you were even born. Just accept that, uh, and you don't have to worry. But in doing that, with good, in, good intentions, I don't think there were evil intentions. Um, no. But, but, in, but in doing that, you sort of destroyed <laughs> the gospel in something that is a Lutheran distinctive. If you, you follow yeah. what I'm saying? Like, exactly, exactly. It, it wasn't... It wasn't some plot to change the scriptures or change the doctrine, mm -hmm. but but once you move the paradigm from what Christ did already mm -hmm. apart mm -hmm. from us, and what and then God promises it and you re receive it through faith, mm -hmm. um, that's where justification happens. When you move that paradigm to now, justification already happened before you believe, mm -hmm. apart from faith, and now. Um, and now you have to now you have to come to faith in in your previous justification mm. in order to receive the benefits from it. You've you actually changed the object of faith from yeah. the promise 
of what God is right now promising to do for you yes. to the, the object of justification, which supposedly God has already done apart mm. from you and everyone else um, in Christ, except mm. the scriptures only use the phrase in Christ to describe people who are in Christ by faith, mm. not this other, this other uh, meaning of that God justified everyone already in Christ. That just isn't, that's not scriptural. No. No, let well, me ask you, but, go, go ahead. ahead. Go, no, go no, ahead. No. Well, I was just going to say, so in order, when the paradigm shifts in the in the thinking, then um, people start to view scriptures differently mm -hmm. too. So there's those those handful of scripture passages that um, that don't, that don't say that God already declared the whole world righteous apart from faith, mm -hmm. but they're reinterpreted that way because mm -hmm. in, in people's thinking, the paradigm has already shifted. And we'll go on, we're going to get into some passages, Pastor, later on a few, and uh, you know, do a little exegesis. And I know that you are you're very knowledge, knowledgeable about this because you went through these issues before. But you know, as a pastor, I would like to ask you, what would, have, what would you have said to someone in that situation? Because obviously, I, I think that you know, uh, the, the pastors back then, they were receiving uh, these people that had real problems. They were having spiritual problems. They were doubting their faith. They were struggling. And, you know, that's that's a problem, of course. That's, that's problematic. You, you don't want to have anyone in your flock suffering or doubting or having this, uh, you know, uh, you know, heartbroken or just doubting. What would you have said or what do you think would have been the proper response if you have someone coming to you in your in your church or your chapel or your community? saying that I am I am doubting my justification. I don't know if God loves me. I don't know if I have faith. What would you have said? What, what is a proper response from a pastor? Instead of, you know, because the option, what, what we're talking about here is that some people opted to say, you don't have to worry because you were justified before you were even born. You just have to acknowledge that. What would be the proper response? Well, you you point them to the clear scripture passages that speak, first of all, of God's love for all people. Now, lo love is not justification. Um, and, and some people have even interpreted John 3.16. Well, that there it is, object of justification. God so loved the world. Hunius was, was uh, quick to point out back in the 1590s that God's love for all people is not the same thing as the justification of people. Mm -hmm. But so you point them to the love of God, which he displayed uh, in John 3.16, it's stated so beautifully, which mm -hmm. he displayed specifically by sending his son mm -hmm. for everyone mm -hmm. so that um, not not to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So mm -hmm. you point to the universal will of God that all people be saved. Amen. You point to the universal work of Christ, which was done for all people, that yes. he died for all. Yes. And then you point to the universal promise, whoever believes Ooh. in him is, <laughs> is, is received, is forgiven, is, is absolved, is justified. There you go. And then you ask, you, then you talk to the person, do you think God would lie to you? Would you think he would make a false promise to you? <laughs> well, of course not. Um, God is not a liar. No, he's not. Yeah. Now, he's, now he's not. Praise be to God. So yeah. so the first thing is, that you, so you lay the foundation. God doesn't hate you. He wants the best for you. He, lo he, he, he loves the whole world. And then he made a promise. If you believe, I think that's a beautiful thing. I mean, you're literally just preaching the gospel to this poor, you know, stricken soul that is coming to you with doubts. And you just remind them, hey, man, God, God is good. God died for the world. And he promised, if you believe in my son, You'll be saved. That's the, that's the gospel. You, what you pretty much did was you gave them a, the gospel. Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. And if they're still wondering, well, but but how do I know if I really believe? Well, did so so maybe you ask them. Um, do you are do you agree with scripture that Christ died for everyone? Because mm -hmm. if you disagree with what the scripture says, um, then well, that's a different problem. Do mm -hmm. you agree with that? Yes. Um, do you think God will lie to you? No. Do you want God to be gracious to you for Jesus' sake? Mm -hmm. Yes, I want that. Guess what? That's faith. <laughs> there you go. 
there you go. That's faith. And then you have, and then you have the promise. Uh, if your faith, uh, let me tell me if it's a a proper uh, use of this passage. But you know, I think of um, you know, if your your if your faith is as, as small as a mustard seed, uh, you know, it, it it is not about because we we like to talk about it's not about us. Uh, it's not about us. It's about Jesus for us. And so, it is not the size of your faith. It is not how consistent your faith is. It is what God did for you, and you just have to believe it, and that's it. Like it's not God is not in the um, in the pursuit of kicking people out of the kingdom because they're having doubts or because they whatever it is that they're going through. We believe that God is a God of is benevolent, benevolent. Uh, I can't I can't speak English today. Uh, he he he's okay. good. Tampoco hay problema. No pasa nada. I had a long day. I had a bunch of. I, I interpret as a that's my profession. So I mean, it's in English. So, so benevolente. Okay, that's the word. He's bene, uh, benevolent. Oh, there you go. Benevolent. So 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 it, you know, just believe that, and, and God is he's willing and able and desirous to receive you. And uh, with your problems, with your small faith or whatever you're having, but to 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 poo poo the gospel and to throw it out, I think it's just um, you know it's just a tragedy. And to me, it's so obvious that you know this individual just uh, missed the mark. You know. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah. With with the best of intentions, if if you get away from the the simple truth of the gospel, you end up creating something that's different. Yeah. And that's dangerous. Very dangerous. Anyways, Pastor, um, you know, I promised uh, you that we would um, go through some passages. Uh, the first one that I have here, I have my uh, my pink Bible, which is uh, my wife's Bible. Uh, Romans chapter 4, uh, verse 5. I think you have something prepared for us. And uh, let me see. The passage is, is it? Is it Romans 4 or 5, Pastor? Is that the correct one? Romans 4 or 5, yep. That's one okay. of those. How, however, to the one who does not work, but trusts God who justifies who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. How do our um, you know, friends uh, use, this pastor, uh, use this passage, Pastor? And what is the... Um, what is the proper perspective or exegesis of this passage? Uh, what is Paul trying to communicate here? So, you know, go for it, Pastor. <laughs> well, if you if we want to start with how it's interpreted to be in line with objective justification, it, it's this. It says, mm -hmm. um, God justifies the ungodly. Um, uh-huh, yes. The, the ungodly is interpreted to mean... Um, the unbeliever correct the uh, so god justifies the unbeliever uh -huh. that is not um that's not what it means uh at all before you go ahead pastor yeah why is it why is it important to make that distinction there ungodly unbeliever why why why, uh, why is that important or is it important <laughs> uh, the the importance of that paul is is um is teaching in romans chapter four is that we're not justified by works. We're justified by faith. Abraham was, is the example that, that Paul's using. And Abraham was found to be justified not by works, but by faith. Mm -hmm. And so Paul, in verse 4 of Romans 4, um, Paul says, To him who works, the wages are not counted as grace, but mm -hmm. as debt. And then he goes on, but, contrasting, to him who does not work, but instead believes on him who justifies the ungodly. His oh. faith is accounted for righteousness. Oh. So th they focus on the word, the ungodly. Sure, the ungodly is very often in scripture. Um, that's the unbeliever. Mm -hmm. Of course, it doesn't make any sense to say that the, the believer in the one who justifies the unbeliever has his faith accounted for righteousness. That's... That's that makes no sense. <laughs> yeah, of course. <laughs> if you believe that God justifies the unbeliever, then your believing is counted for righteousness. That I'm sorry. 
uh, that that makes no sense. And and Johann Gerhardt understood that perfectly well in his commentary on Romans mm. chapter four, verse five. This is what he says. With the word ungodly, the ungodly is not understood as remaining securely in his ungodliness without repentance, mm -hmm. but as he comes out of it through repentance and faith. This one is judged as righteous before the judgment of God through the imputed righteousness of Christ mm -hmm. and is absolved from sins since compensation has been made for his sins through the satisfaction of Christ. Therefore, mm -hmm. such a penitent and believing man mm -hmm. who is certainly ungodly and sinful in himself mm -hmm. is nonetheless righteous in Christ through faith. That's how mm -hmm. That's how Johann Gerhardt, probably the greatest dogmatician um, of the Lutheran Church, um, interpreted Romans 4, verse 5. Very good. Okay, so, and so it, it seems to me like when, when, as you were going through the, the passage, it is very obvious that in the context, the word, the, the op, one of the operative words in that whole context is the word faith. And so to throw it out and, and, and act as if, you know, you are justified without faith being contemplated is kind of doing violence to the text because, you know, the word faith is very clear there. He's using the example of, of Abraham. He became justified when he had faith. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, yeah, it seems, um, it seems uh, nonsensical to say yeah. the least. You were going to say something else about that no, passage? No, I think okay. that, I think that covers it. Okay, and then the next one is uh, <clears throat> First uh, John, uh, chapter two, uh, verse two. Uh, it says, um, "He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but also for the sins of the whole world." So that's another passage that is used by you know our friends that hold to uh, universal justification. Uh, you know, to defend that, you know, that belief or that position. So wh yeah. what would you say is a proper, first, how are they using it? How, well, I think it's very clear for the whole world. Uh, how, what is a proper, um, you know, belief or what is the context trying to communicate? Sure. Well, the passage does clearly say Christ is the propitiation for the sins of the world. Uh, the propitiation, the, that which, um, that which earns back God's favor, mm -hmm. uh, that that which um, that the the reason for God's mercy, mm -hmm. uh, all of those things are are in the word propitiation. Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in fact, in Romans three, Christ Himself is called the the propitiator, or the, mm -hmm. the again the propitiation, um, or the mercy seat, all mm -hmm. all related in Greek. Yes, He is also known as the, the atonement. He is the atonement, or he is mm -hmm. the atonement. sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Um, we certainly don't deny that. We, we, are, we are very glad to confess that and glad for that truth. He do, it doesn't say that he has justified the whole world. It says he's the propitiation for the sins of the whole world. In well, other got, words, in other yes. words unli unlimited atonement. Yes. yes. Yes, the atonement that he made was for the whole world, not just mm. for a few, not just for those who would believe, but for all. But okay. um, only those who appeal to the propitiator through faith actually escape the condemnation that the world remains under. So while Christ was the propitiation for the sins of the whole world, the unbelieving world will still answer for their sins, still stands condemned before God. Whereas the believer in Christ, who who flees in faith to the to Christ, the propitiator, mm -hmm. um, does not stand under condemnation any longer. So the difference. So what? If you could rephrase that or repeat that again, uh, what is the difference between propitiation, atonement, and justification? You know, for for our friends that are not, uh, you know, theologically, uh, yeah. you know astute or you know whatever uh, a, a, a lot of theologically trained people um equate the atonement with justification okay of course as we talked about that's what samuel huber started to do and he was quickly yes. uh told he was wrong but it's mm -hmm. what it's what a lot of people still do all well, the mm -hmm. atonement is justification which is why um after i was suspended from the wisconsin synod back in 2012 mm -hmm. 
I had people in the Wisconsin Synod uh, accusing me of denying the atonement, mm. which, which was ridiculous and absurd and contrary to everything I had said and written. Um, but because they equated those things in their mind, if I denied objective justification, I must be denying Correct. the atonement itself. Not Correct. true. The atonement is the price that had to be paid mm -hmm. in order for sinners to be reconciled with God. Mm -hmm. It's the price. That's what the atonement is. It's the it's the price that Christ had to pay was both perfect obedience under the law mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and suffering of the penalty which the sinner deserved. That's the atonement that Christ made. And if I may, it, go ahead. If if I may interject, uh, tell me if I'm wrong in my uh, estimation here. It's it's the satisfaction of the wrath of God. Is it would would you would you put it in that words? The atonement is a satisfaction or uh, making making amends for the righteous wrath of God or the righteous penalty that men had to undergo for their sin. Would that be a proper way to say it? Yeah, it was the satisfaction. In fact, that that's the word that's usually used in the Book of Concord. Okay. For the propitiation or the atonement is mm -hmm. Christ made satisfaction for our okay. sins. Okay. Yeah, he paid all the penalty necessary to be paid for our sins okay okay so that is atonement propitiation yes and justification is justification is god now declaring the person who trusts in christ who flees to christ in faith righteous innocent okay. who, it's god justification is god's welcoming a person into his family into his house into his heaven mm -hmm. um, in, in making him an heir of eternal life. That's justification. And that certainly didn't happen for everyone. Not everyone is an heir of eternal life. Not everyone has been adopted by God and made a child of God. Um, but as John says in, in the first chapter of his gospel, to those who believed, mm -hmm. he gave the right to become children of God. Amen. Amen. So, um, so yes, it seems, you know, from, looking from the outside, it seems like... Um, uh, our friends were trying to, so like objective justification seems to be in line or in tune with uh, atonement because of the universality of it, but justification is not universal for everybody if the element of faith is not first, uh, you know, had or, you know, you, you appropriate, you're justified by faith. Atonement is just a done deal. It was satisfied, Christ satisfying uh, for our sins, for the Father who sent him, you know, to die for our sins. Justification is a completely, so it's, it seems, to someone it might seem like it's just a, a word, uh, like semantics or, you know, but but it's not. It's, uh, it, it really is a uh, sort of a sinister or um, very uh, destructive uh view of the gospel and justification. So it, it is it is important to 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 deal with this, to clarify terms in order to in order to maintain the gospel. If you if you don't, then you are mudding the waters, you're bringing confusion, it seems to me. Absolutely. I mean for a couple of reasons. First of all, mm -hmm. um, we can argue about human man-made terms all we want. But when the Holy Spirit has used a certain term in a certain way in Scripture, um, we're really foolish to start using the same term in different ways than he than he's used mm -hmm. it in Scripture. Okay. Why? Because he knew what he was doing when he gave us those words. Chemnitz makes that argument quite a bit um, in in his examen and in his Lochi. Okay. About the use of God's God's use of words in Scripture, including the mm -hmm. word to justify. Mm -hmm. Second of all. Um, if if your th our thinking um, is founded on our words, <laughs> if our words get get messed up, it, our thinking can't be far behind. Um, God forgave everybody. People people come out and say God forgave everybody. That's that's not how the Bible uses the word forgave. No, actually, God loves everyone. God gave His Son for everyone. God wants everyone to be forgiven. Mm -hmm. But that happens through faith in Christ. Mm -hmm. So if we just nudge our language just a little bit, then our thinking of that issue gets kind of messed up too and confused. Mm -hmm. And thirdly, 
uh, it's important to keep to, to understand that the those who hold to objective justification are mm -hmm. not content with with me, for example. If I if if I would say, well, I believe in universal atonement that Christ made for everyone. Mm -hmm. Justification is only by faith. Those who teach objective subjective justification are not content with us. That's why I was I was suspended from the Wisconsin Synod. Oh yes, yes, yes. Over 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 this issue, mm -hmm. and um, so they're not content with it. If someone who believed in objective justification just meant, well, I just believe that Christ died for everybody, and we're justified through faith in Christ, I'd say, great. I I give thanks to God for what you believe. You believe the right thing. Now let's talk about the words you're using and the language, because mm -hmm. it's not. Yeah, because that language has been used to keep people out of church bodies and excommunicate them and call them heretics. Mm, okay, so they're not they're not happy when you make a distinction because they feel that you're being why why would they object to that because you're minimizing uh, or uh, attempting against their conscience. I mean, what what is in your experience, as you were going through this uh, issue, uh, well, was... in, my, in my case, it, it was it wasn't just semantics; it was the doctrine itself. Our district president came and back in 2012, and in front of my congregation, and and I explained in front of the congregation, I, I absolutely teach and believe that Christ earned forgiveness for all people. Mm. That he made atonement for all people, that mm -hmm. he wants all people to be saved, that the promise of the gospel is universal, believe in Christ and you'll be saved. But he said uh, he went to Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary and got two questions from them that I had to be able to answer with an unequivocal yes or no. Mm -hmm. All right. Yes, in order to pass. Did God forgive all the sins of all people 2000 years ago when Christ died on the cross? And, mm -hmm. and even though I explained he, I believe he earned forgiveness for all. I believe he paid for the sins of all. But mm. no, he forgives people through faith in Christ. He justifies people through faith in Christ. And because of that answer, I was suspended from the ministerium. Mm. So again, it wasn't just semantics. It was the, the, the words have taken on a new meaning, unfortunately, in objective, subjective justification. And even when you explained it, so it's, it's so it's not a it's not a thing of misunderstanding or semantics like you're, like you're saying it's because you broke it down you explained it and still they were offended by yes your words as you as you nuanced it and explained you know it, you know he he tied for everybody it's a, it's a, everybody can participate of this but for you to be justified forgiven you have to have the element of faith they didn't want to hear that no no yeah, they said yeah. that was false doctrine they okay. condemned that doctrine. Wow. Um, so really condemned the scriptural doctrine of justification by faith alone in Christ alone. That's serious business. Now, uh, and we're almost closing here. And I thank you again, Pastor Paul Radeke, Radeke for being with us. Excuse me, I mispronounced your name. <clears throat> um, so you you mentioned before that uh, words, uh, you, you, you had a pattern that it is, uh, it's not semantics because it also affects the, the, the way that we think. So it's not just words, it affects the way that we think. Uh, would you agree with me or you know, correct me if I'm mistaken? Don't you think that it also affects the way that we behave, the way that we view sin? Like I, I really believe that uh, teaching, so words, like you said, words affect our minds and our minds also kind of govern the way that we encounter or engage with the world what we think about sin you know and when i'm thinking about these things uh, do you think that there is any way that perhaps we start poo-pooing the significance of of sin of my work and you know sanctification or not taking the passages seriously like for example work out your salvation these kind of things well well christ did it all for me or you know um you know improving the way that i treat my brothers and sisters in christ and and and, and growing in holiness uh, do you think those things are affected or it just stays a, a as an issue where it's just oh words and beliefs and we're going to excommunicate people or you know get into a, a yelling match or does it really have an effect on people as they carry out their Christian life in, in real sure. time, in real life. Sure it does. And 
I'm, I'm sure that the people who teach it don't intend for that to happen. But yeah, if you believe, if, if you're taught, uh, all sins were already forgiven by God. Mm -hmm. well, then if, if, I, if, there's, if there's a sin that I'd really like to go out and commit, mm -hmm. and I'm contemplating, let's see, should I do it or not? Um, if there's a doctrine that says that sin has all, not only been paid for, but already forgiven. Wow. You, you, that might lead me to just say, yeah, well, it's already been forgiven. Subconsciously, right? Kind of yeah. in a way, right? Yeah. Not that anybody intends for that to happen who teaches object of justification, but yeah. sure, sure, it's an obvious and logical result of, of that doctrine. But I think even worse is our understanding of God and how we view God. Mm -hmm. If we view God as um, as having already He's the owner of heaven, right? He's the one who holds the keys. Mm -hmm. if, if he's already said the whole world is righteous in his sight, mm -hmm. then he's, if he sends people to hell, which he does, mm -hmm. of scripture, then that seems rather unjust um, because he's the one who gets to declare people righteous or unrighteous. And if he looked at the world and declared everyone righteous, Mm -hmm. And yet, still sends people to hell. Mm. That that goes against his own character. Yes, his, his own self. Um, yes, and and worse still, um, if if I'm absolved, just like Judas Iscariot was absolved, supposedly with the whole world, that doesn't give me much comfort. It does not, because if Judas was absolved, we know we know Judas went to hell. Yes. I would say from scripture, we know that. Yes. Um, and, I, and we know other people who do. If if I'm absolved just like they were absolved. And I end up in that, and he, I, I could end up in that same place. I could be just like them. Yeah. yeah. It, I don't absolution that. needs to mean something. Exactly. Absolution needs to mean you are not going to hell. You are yes. God's child. You are forgiven. And um, you're a child of heaven. And then again, an heir of eternal life. If it doesn't mean that, if it means something else, God absolved the world, but but didn't accept the world as his children mm -hmm. and didn't make the world heirs of eternal life, then how does that help me? Mm -hmm. It seems to yeah. me like a like a like a big stumbling block because yeah. like, because like I, I know a lot of. So, of course, I have a bunch of family members that are, you know, Baptists or charismatic and whatnot, Methodists and whatnot. And one of the uh, things that I mean, of course, we have disagreements disagreements with the, those traditions but one of the things that i respect and i i uh, I, I value from those traditions pastor uh, radecki <clears throat> is the fact that these people you know really strive to live in holiness they're very you know they, they're very sensitive to anything like uh, like sin they you know alcohol is they're drinking the beers they, they're scandalized by you know these kind of things they don't want to look at things that are inappropriate you name it they they really struggle with um sanctification or they seem to not have peace really because to them it's like they have to work these things out so but but i respect that they i respect the fact that they are sensitive to sin they take they take it seriously they they really want to please god and live uh holy lives if you will but then on the other side of the spectrum we we have this doctrines which kind of push us on the other way which kind of uh, could make us a bit, a, a bit uh, hedonistic, or very, uh, how can I say, um, cavalier <laughs> with, with, with sin, because it's like, well, you, hey, hey, homie, you don't have to worry about that because it's it's all taken care of. I mean, I think that the idea is will be for for us to fall in the middle, not to be struggling and really uh, mortif uh, tormenting ourselves. And not fall on the other side, which is like, you know, nonchalant, you know, do what you will. It's taken care of. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. So it, yeah. it seems to be going that way, you know. Well, I, I think that those who came up with objective, subjective justification or general justification and individual justification, mm -hmm. I, I know that their intention was yes. to point people to the means of grace. But ultimately, it it doesn't point people toward the means of grace. Yes. If if you're basing your everything on of forgiveness that was already pronounced once for all upon everybody. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, justification by faith 
pushes us always toward the means of grace and from the means of grace then toward a life of service to god joyful mm -hmm. service to god not fearful oh no oh i just i just looked at something that might uh -huh. be something, uh, I, I need to i don't know what the means of grace are where god keeps directing us this is where god forgives sins yes this yes. is where he keeps forgiving sins. This is mm -hmm. where your even your baptism, your one-time baptism is continually preached mm -hmm. and the body and blood of Christ are given out for the forgiveness of sins. Yes. You can even go to your pastor and confess your sins and receive absolution yes. from your pastor. Mm -hmm. So, and, and you go to church to receive the continual preaching that sustains the faith by which you're justified. Amen. So, all of all of it, um, scriptural doctrine points us to the means of grace. Yes, and and then to a joyful life of service to God as His forgiven children, Amen. as we talk about daily in our baptism. Amen. Well, anyways, Pastor, uh, you know, just to close out, I want to give you uh, a space, you know, to say uh, words in closing, um, kind of uh, remind us uh, what is the gospel? Why is this? Why why is it so problematic about? This uh, no, teaching or thesis of objective uh, justification and subjective justification. Uh, so, if you have any thoughts that you want to say in closing, uh, I would appreciate it if you if uh, if you do so. So you know you you have the microphones to do that, Pastor Rydecki. Sure, the objective subjective justification is gets us away from scripture, so that we're not actually reading scripture as scripture anymore. Um, we have to reinterpret all those passages. It's a doctrine that Jesus and the apostles never preached and never taught. That's dangerous. Mm -hmm. Because when we listen to Jesus, he says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. He who believes and is baptized will be saved. He even asks Martha, um, I'm the resurrection and the life. He who lives and believes in me will never die. Do you believe this? <laughs> he even dared to ask her if she believed. Um, the Apostle Peter on the day of Pentecost can preach to the crowds of Jerusalem, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Christ Jesus for the forgiveness of sins. Um, Paul, Paul can preach from jail in Philippi, believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. The scripture is consistent with that preaching, with that message. It, there, there is no solid scripture behind and by the way you're all forgiven jesus didn't, <laughs> jesus didn't preach that way the apostles never preached that way and we shouldn't preach that way either yeah we but we can preach christ died for you christ yeah. died for all god wants you to be saved he's calling you right now in the gospel whoever you are no matter who you are because he calls out to all people in the gospel to repent and believe in christ jesus for salvation and you can be sure that, that that is God calling to you, no matter who you are. Amen. Thank you so much. And I really appreciate also uh, the uh, snippet of what you gave us as far as what you would say to someone that came to you struggling spiritually, uh, that God loves them and that God is faithful to his promises. So it's not only that you know that he loves you because of John 3.16, but also that he says, if you believe this, you shall be saved. There's no doubt in that. And also in closing, um, if you can tell us, the public, uh, the, the audience, uh, the quote that you mentioned from Melanchthon uh, that you read, where, where, where did you get it from? Uh, All right, let me look that up here again. <clears throat> that was uh, Melanchthon in... Now I've got Apology, Article 5, Paragraph 184, beginning there. Apology 5, what else? Uh, beginning at Paragraph 184. 184. I forget uh, that's one that, that has the different numbering from one version of the Book of Concord to the other, but eventually you should be able to find it there under the Apology of the Oxford Confession, Article 5, Paragraph 184. Okay. Lex, uh, my, my, my co-host and my friend, uh, he is, uh, you know, Melanchthon is one of his homeboys, so I'm pretty sure that he's going to appreciate <laughs> appreciate that quote. He really, uh, he, he loves Gerard and he loves uh, Melanchthon, and we have a lot of people also in the Intuitive uh, Fide group that uh, are big fans of uh, Melanchthon and whatnot. I think, so I think I. he was a great, there you go, he was a great theologian, very clear, uh, very helpful. Gerhard is another beast. But anyways, um, 
this was Wittenberg project. I really appreciate you, Pastor, for being with us. I, I hope that you guys uh, profit from this conversation. I hope it was not uh, abrasive or insulting or any of these things. I know that uh, a lot of people get into you know very emotional conversations, but I think that we can have a conversation without being uh, you know we, where we can be um, uh, ironic, if you will. We can be uh, have a friendly tone. And communicate our um, our concerns, uh, guide us back to what the gospel is, the beauty of the promises uh, of Christ in the gospel, uh, follow the pattern of preaching that the apostles had, and uh, stop with this uh, belief system that is uh, doesn't really do much to help. It's, it's just uh, confuses things. And just for you know, just to tell you, Pastor, just in uh, here, you know, in, in private, but everybody's listening. <laughs> uh, I have a lot of I have a few friends uh, back in my country and in other countries uh, that are Lutheran, are confessional, and they have never heard of this before. And what I get from them is uh, just confusion. Uh, it, it, it seems like uh, they they don't understand the purpose of doing this. They don't see how it is consistent. So uh, yeah, I, I think it, you know we just keep it simple. Uh, atonement is atonement. Justification is justification. That God. Um, you know, atone for the sins doesn't mean that everybody was justified. Just keep it simple. Uh, the, I think doctrine is very clear. We we don't need to tinker with that and, and make it more complicated than it should be. It's, you know, I always go back to John three sixteen, and it really is that simple. I wish we could just keep it that simple. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, brother. I really appreciate it. So, anyways, uh, Wittenberg Project, like, subscribe, and share. Pastor Paul Rydecki, he has a Facebook presence. I believe that you're on Facebook. So if people I want to have more questions, they can ask me or, you know, Witten Project, Wittenberg Project. And we can, uh, if we have any doubts or any any further comments, we may have another uh, conversation to address that as well. But anyways, uh, thank you so much, Guy, for holding, us, uh, holding on with us for more than an hour. And I really appreciate you, Pastor, taking time from your day uh, and, and doing this for us. Thank, thank you so you. much, Pastor, Wittenberg Project. See you next time. Bye-bye.